Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next Avatar video. This one is going to be the first of three end of year videos that I always do uh, on the channel. This will be the top five Avatar and Korra story moments for 2022. And following this, um, as we get more towards the end of the year, will be the uh, Avatar year in review for 2022, as well as the Avatar 2023 story and merchandise preview video. But we are here for the top five story moments. So just before we jump into that, I do want to mention I do have YouTube channel membership enabled on my channel if you do want to help support the channel. And it really, really does help. There are two tiers. Uh, the Light Spirit tier is uh, $1 a month and the Avatar tier is $5 a month. And um, the basic difference between them is that the higher tier, you do get access to uh, exclusive videos. I put up one exclusive video every month on the channel. Most of them are quite long gaming videos. Uh, most recent ones will be Sonic Frontiers. Uh, that was the November video and then the December video, which I haven't recorded yet, but will be up by the time this video is live, will be a Pokemon uh, Violet video. So uh, keep that in mind. And then there's a bunch of other ones from um, past months as well. But at all tiers, you get access to loyalty badges uh, in the comments and uh, live chat when I do live streams, as well as some custom emojis that I made that, again, you can use in the comments and in live streams. So, again, that, that's just an option that is there to support the channel, um, which, again, really does help. But let's jump into the video here. And we have to start before we get straight into the list with... What are we taking these moments from? What was the story content that actually came out in 2022? Was this a good year for Avatar content? Was it a bad year? Let's go through it. So, um, what we had this year was we had the free comic book day 2022 book. This was a half Avatar, half Korra. But for the sake of this video, only half of the book counts. And that is the Korra half, which is the comic Beach Wars, which is why I say one short story. Something happened with this comic. The Avatar side of it was meant to be an Aang short story. Didn't end up actually getting that. We got a preview for the Chibi comic, which I'm not factoring in here because the Chibi comic is a 2023 release. So we got that. The Avatar Legends role-playing game. Now, this does include both books. It includes the core book and the Wan Shi Tong adventure guide. I'm just including them here as one because that's what the information basically is. This is a bit of an interesting, brand new piece of story content. We've never had this style of thing before, really, where it's less story and more just ba lore, background information, just straight details about eras and stuff like that. But there is notably some new stuff, including Roku era information. Next, the big one, the big thing from this year, the dawn of Yang Chen, our third Chronicles of the Avatar novel and the first non Kyoshi novel. Novels are always great. This book was great. This was the most notable content that we had in the year. And then the reason that this video is happening now in late December rather than uh, November when the book first came out is just because of the weird delays and split release dates and stuff like that so everyone can watch this video and that is Legend of Korra Patterns in Time. The only kind of normal comic release of the year from Dark Horse that has new content in it and like the free comic it is only partially new content. Uh, there are five new short stories in here um, but of course, some of them are better than others, so not everyone is going to make it onto the list overall. Um, so an interesting lineup, but immediately there will be things like Beach Wars is not making it onto this list. A large amount of the lore and information from the Avatar Legends role-playing game is stuff that we do already know. And then because it is more kind of facts and details and less proper story being presented to us and um, it's kind of hard on this list to justify and, and kind of explain allow it to make that many spots on the list it it, it will be featured but um, not as much as you think i do have a separate video where i go over the best moments from avatar legends role-playing game but for the sake of this list i don't think that many of the moments make the list compared to other things the novel is obviously where most of 
uh, this list is going to come from. And then patterns and time, it's obviously a bit hit and miss. Some of the stuff won't be featured, some of the stuff will. That's the kind of point here. So uh, a decent year. It's hard to say, say that a year where we had a novel is bad, but especially on the Dark Horse side of things, the comics, it, you, you would have to say it was not a good year. It was probably Dark Horse's worst year with the Avatar and Korra franchise. Um, there was just problems with pretty much everything new that they put out. There was a problem with the free comic book day book, delays, issues, and a lot of people aren't super happy with the selection of stories in Patterns in Time. Therefore, you know, not a great year from Dark Horse. Notably, not a single page of new Avatar The Last Airbender comics. That's really notable in my mind. But let's start the list. And we always start off the list with honorable mentions. So this time there are two honorable mentions. The first one here is our first time getting to meet Yasuko in Skyscrapers. So this is uh, Sami's uh, mother, Yasuko, whose name we knew before. We had an image from like a picture of her, but we had obviously never seen her on screen or in any story content really before in terms of like what she's like as a character. So getting to meet her for the first time here was actually a pretty notable thing. It's one of the main standout things that happens in Patterns in Time. It's a bit unfortunate that Skyscrapers is only a four page story. It, it's nice for what it is, but definitely there are other Yasuko stories we would like to get. And especially, I, I think, knowing that the initial intent with this was that this story was a little bit darker. I get the impression it might have been what happened to Yasuko, uh, her death, that that might have been what the initial intent with the writing was. And then we ended up with this small four page story that, again, is nice, has cute moments showing what Yasuko was like as a mother, inspiring Asami. Um, that was really good to see. And so it's just that, that it's getting the honorable mention here because it's a character I think we all would like to know more about. And at least she got some focus. It doesn't make it onto the list because I don't think it, it is the kind of fully fulfilling the potential of this character. And that's why it's a honorable mention and not quite um, fully on the list. Honorable mention two is that we switch over to the Dawn of Yang Chen. And... This one's a little bit of a cheat, and, and, and the reason it's not on the list is because, as you can see from what I say here, it's not very specific. I just have basically the many fun and sometimes emotional Yang Chen and Kavik scenes. So this is sort of a choose your favorite character moment between these two. This was the sort of star dynamic of the Yang Chen book was how this friendship formed and what happened along the way. Uh, we got a bit of a different dynamic than we'd seen in any of the Kyoshi books because it was Yang Chen meeting this character for the first time and a, a, a relationship forming out of sort of absolutely nowhere. Whereas a lot of the main characters who knew each other in the Kyoshi novels, it was sort of pre-established that they were already friends. So having one of these dynamics, you know, see it develop on, on, on the page was fantastic to see to see and um, if I was to highlight something a little bit more specific I would like to highlight a lot of the very early chapter stuff their initial meetings with each other are just so much fun they get you into this book and what by the time you get to the point where they are being a little bit more open with each other and you get the more emotional scenes they work because their friendship is already there because of the fun scenes from before. So the ones that really stand out are like, of, of course, Yang Chen saves him from getting kind of like beaten up by the, the guards and stuff like that. Um, she kind of seemingly lets him get away with a few things early on. But then she just like randomly turns up at his house. And it's such an amazing moment because he he's completely taken aback by this and she just uses the situation to her advantage like against him and just controls the scene um stuff like that the kind of more fun banter between these two was fantastic to see and i felt like somewhere on this list i had to mention this key dynamic that going into book two with the kind of status of their kind of friendship 
I'm so excited to see what they do with these two in terms of when will they interact again in a way will they interact again or did what happened in this book leave a permanent rift between the two that's an exciting dynamic going into the next book uh, because so much especially of the early book is about these two becoming friends and how it initially comes across as they're just making this sort of like deal to kind of work with each other but then they do actually become friends it's uh, really really good stuff for sure and it's one of those ones where it's sort of like in the comments immediately like which, which is your favorite Yang Chen and Kavik scene do you go for more of the fun ones or more of the emotional ones like uh, Yang Chen frustrated like out on the beach kind of like airbending out into the ocean and Kavik comes out and they have that conversation where they kind of kind of more or less reveal the kind of like the the people they've lost kind of to each other in a way um so there's my honorable mention so this gets us into the top five list proper number five a change in the wind from patterns in time Cora and asami give advice to janora so this is more or less me choosing the full story of a change in the wind as the number five slot um specifically more focused i would say on the actual like plot of this which is Cora and, uh, and asami giving advice rather than necessarily the Cora sammy side of things which is nice if you're a huge fan of that relationship but i actually from a character writing perspective really loved this one because it felt like the writer really knew what the characters had been through already and that they were perfect to help janora through an issue that made complete sense for her to actually be dealing with yes in terms of the actual plot details there's not a lot going on here but i did appreciate that they just laser focused in on character dynamic between like three of the best characters uh in the show in terms of like cora and janora for sure are like some of the more de well-developed characters and then people really like asami even though she at times does feel a little bit underdeveloped so it was actually nice to have her get a chance like she's the first one to give janora advice in this story more about that sort of you know i know what it's like to be in charge of people like you now are janora whereas cora gets the whole defining yourself by your abilities kind of aspect but it's great referencing back to you know the what these two other characters are, are about and fitting it in with what janora is more recently dealing with it's just to me a really strong story overall that uh, stood out to me quite a lot uh, reading patterns in time next number four we go back to the dawn of yang chen and this one is kalyan is revealed to be the boss boss so uh, getting towards the end of the book this is one of the big reveals and i wanted one on this list that was sort of a a big sort of kavik moment and that is this happening you get a lot over the course of the book with uh, kavik about how he really sort of in a way defines himself and especially his past on you know what happened to his brother he's sort of searching for his brother who and um, he goes up and down about how like he feels his brother might be like missing something happened to him then it seems to become clear that no his brother did just like leave on his own terms and um, and then it does all build up to this moment when right as Kavik has become very close has truly become the avatar companion to Yang Chen this reveal just you know lands straight into his life and messes everything up in a way kalyan revealed to be working for uh, chai si, um as the kind of boss boss here of the organization and it's more than just that reveal and the kind of like shock nature of it it's what happens in the scene in the chapter following through where they actually talk and that Kalyan, who like, Kavik looks up to so much and has sort of followed in his footsteps to a certain degree, you see how much Kalyan has changed and that he is full on in this side of things, the whole errand runner aspect. Like he's leaned into that very, very heavily and it has changed him in a way from the person that he once was. And so kavik who has kind of beat himself up so much about him not being good enough kalyan kind of begins to do the same thing here to 
manipulate uh, Kavik into siding with him over Yang Chen. And I think it just builds up to this big moment where, like, of course, Kavik's big sort of mistake in a way is in a way not being strong enough here when he meets his brother again to just kind of hold his ground, not temporarily betray Yang Chen. Um, but the way that this scene is laid out, the kind of emotional manipulation that happens from Kalyan here, I think is really, really strong across how they did the reveal and then the actual dialogue that they have. Because Kalyan is interesting in that that is more or less like the only scene he has in the book. He's really only in that chapter following through. And then you just get explained that like he got out before things got crazy at the end of the book. And the implication, I guess, is that he's going to play a role in the next book. But we don't know exactly what. But it's clear Kavik needs to have another conversation with his brother. So very, very exciting to see how this goes. And in the same way that the whole Yang Chen and Jetson stuff kind of followed through the book of like Yang Chen has lost someone trying to sort of in a way get her back to a certain degree with what happened there. This is Kavik's thing, but it happens in a bit of a different way. And now Kalyan is, you know, a, a different person. He's not the brother he once knew. Next, we go to uh, number three. And here is our Legends RPG uh, example on the list. So the Legends RPG reveals Princess Zaysan, Sozin's sister. I, I have this on the list, and the reason this is the only one on the list is that, to me, this is the one thing from the book that I've seen people talk about at length online. It seems to be the one main takeaway that most fans have from the Legend RPG. Yes, if you look into the detail, read the whole book, there is a lot there that is somewhat interesting. But... This character's existence we didn't know a single thing about before, and so revealing that Sozin had a sister, you know, a princess of the Fire Nation, and then all of the kind of interesting things that they kind of do with her sort of story setup of like her kind of romance with Ryoshan, uh, her, her connection with the whole kind of like airbender stuff, the guiding wind, and all the, all this kind of really interesting stuff they added in the Roku era that they didn't just name drop Princess Zaysan Sozin's sister. They actually more fully fleshed out her story to the point where we want a, a proper story told that involves this character. Now, a lot will depend on if they actually go ahead and tell that story ever. Otherwise, this will just exist as like a couple of paragraphs in the Legends RPG book. It's cool that we know it, but I would like to know more about it because obviously the implication is that we didn't know about this character because Sozin succeeds and the implication would be that Zaysan dies or is killed at some point but because the RPG sets up stories but never tells you what happens it's hard to know canonically with you know what way to take this character but far and away the thing that impacted the fandom the most this year from the Legend RPG was definitely <laughs> Princess Zaysan being revealed and just the, the full extent of it. Like she has she has chi blocking training and you know she's actively working against her brother. So that's an interesting point, just that even back during this era, there were people within the Fire Nation who didn't agree with everything going on and how it sort of fit into the whole idea of that kind of disconnect of like the Fire Nation not having full control over everything because air nomad ideals are beginning to kind of take root to a certain extent. Interesting stuff. Number two, Yang Chen talks to Mama Ayunarak uh, and we get Order of the White Lotus versus Yang Chen's approach as the Avatar. Uh, and this is across basically two chapters, conversations and also traces. To me, this stands out as being one of the most interesting scenes in the whole book to analyze because I picked a basically a Kavik, a strong Kavik scene from a character perspective and here is the Yang Chen moment from the character perspective because you sort of wait the whole book to get to the point of like why is Yang Chen the way she is? Why does she do things like this? Why is she, um, you know, amazing 
avatar diplomat negotiator, but then part spy master? Why does she go so far to get things done immediately? Why is there no sense of waiting to see what happens? And so seeing her encounter, basically, if in fact we kind of like the one group that can accomplish similar things in a way to the Avatar, the Order of the White Lotus, and contrasting how they do things is a great way to get her to explain why she is the way she is. That she sees the Order of the White Lotus as a group that only chooses to act at moments of importance. And it's like, who defines what is important? That means that by default, there are moments where you could act, but you choose not to because you don't deem it important enough. Whereas Yang Chen is always like, no, I'm going to act because I feel this is what has to be done here. If we wait, something bad is going to happen. And the book has multiple moments where you you know sort of that this is the way she is. Like when she mentions like the aftermath of the events of the Rift comic and so on. And you get it here of... It's a clear difference in how they do things. Mama Yunarak doesn't like that Yang Chen is so quick to act and wishes she would take a, a more kind of a laid back approach and wait. And so they begin to get into like she almost criticizes Yang Chen as the avatar and it gets brought up like your gifts and you get that really emotional scene where she Yang Chen realizes those early moments of her life where everything was great. She was still basically being sort of spied on and there's like a traitor in the temple to a certain degree. Um, and that hurts Yang Chen. And again, we get to the point of like, basically a Unirak asks like, why are you this way? What are you doing? Why don't you use your gifts and make that be your thing as the avatar? You have such a strong connection to the past lives. Why don't you just basically preach the wisdom of the past avatars to bring peace to the world and yang chen after all of this setup reveals that oh yeah i, I, can, I can just yeah full-on talk to my past lives pretty much like whenever i want i've done it i've spoke to dozens of the past lives and they all agree on one thing and that is that you know basically waiting isn't the solution they all had regrets None of them ever wished that they had waited to deal with the situation. They all had regrets that they missed something or something like that. And so that's why Yang Chen has this approach where she goes so far and puts in so much effort to make sure she is seen to do something and isn't just waiting for a disaster to happen to pick up the pieces. She wants to preemptively take action to stop something from getting out of control. And... It's a very interesting approach that makes you kind of feel like, oh yeah, well, that is, I suppose, a criticism of the Order of the White Lotus. And in a way, highlights a bit of a positive of the Order of the White Lotus deciding to come a little bit more out into the public and be a bit more generally involved in, like, Korra's era, I guess. Um, and it's just great to see Order of the White Lotus stuff and just the the kind of other side of them. They're not just these legendary characters who are all cool. They also do just kind of hang out and drink tea and speak wisdom to each other and ignore certain things that happen in the world. And so I just felt that this was a, a strong, strong scene start to finish. The Mama Ayunarak reveal over the course of the book that like, you know, if you're not paying super close attention, you can forget that, like, the character mentioned in the early stages of the book by Kavik is this character that Yang Chen later meets and so on. And it seems like she's also going to play some sort of a role in the next book because now she has sort of brought Kavik, like, into her team. Like, is Kavik going to be White Lotus? It's very, very interesting stuff. But, um, love that scene, absolutely. Which means, number one, again a Yang Chen moment, and this time it is the reveal of unanimity as a group of three combustion vendors. Uh, and then, I suppose, combined with that, that there are more combustion vendors as well, it's just that this specific group is three, but that they're, the whole project, basically, has the potential for more 
and that we're basically exploring the origins in a way how combustion bending works and sure we don't get all of it here but i felt the build-up of what unanimity was was really well done over the course of the book and the reveal was in my mind a very good payoff when you set up a book to have one core mystery um it can often be tricky to deliver on it once you get there to me it completely worked and part of that was like the experience i had going through the book and in a way like when you as a reader in this book actually figure out that that's what it is because you have sort of a few opportunities before they full-on just reveal what it is and so that's why like last chances is i think the chapter where i first figured it out and then it's like a chapter or two later when you just get the full-on reveal of like oh yeah here's one of the combustion menders and this is basically what they're doing but to me it worked it made sense and yes this can change the political landscape of Yang Chen's era. The, these world leaders who all of them seem to want to uh, latch on to something that can give them power. Of course, it's important to keep the, the details on, on the combustion benders in, in check. And so, you yes, the actual action scene involving the combustion benders is relatively small at the end of this book. But it's that political implication of just the fact that this group of people can seemingly make combustion benders when they want to. And that theoretically there are more of them out there is really interesting. Plus the fact that the three that we know about can still play a role if certain things happen is a, a, a big kind of point. That it took this really clever plan to efficiently deal with three combustion menders without like absolute chaos going wild because if if yang chen basically didn't do what she did in terms of soaking the air out of the room and just carefully knocking these characters out this would be you know one of these things where you would probably have to sacrifice people to to take these combustion menders down that's how kind of skillful uh, you need to be to take down combustion benders especially multiple of them being around as well and then just all the little details here about the fact that clearly this is early stage of combustion bending the little teases we have about how they were sort of like trained or their ability was unlocked and um, the whole drowning mention it's super interesting to theorize about because it really highlights that the next book I'm guessing is going to have to go into what they mean by that and probably might have a couple of other combustion menders around as well. Um, so I, if, if this one fully worked for me in that it was something that's really exciting and interesting coming out of book one and is a thing that I'm excited about going into book two. And I think for a book that is a part of a two part uh, of two books, that's a really strong thing I think to have. And I think the groups of, of Yang Chen scenes that I chose, I felt were like were the right ones to have. Sort of one highlighting both Kavik and Yang Chen's dynamic, a scene for Kavik, a scene for Yang Chen, and then the big sort of reveal of the book. I think that's a nice blend of scenes. But there are still other stuff that I would have loved to include it on here. But I didn't want to make this just the Yang Chen list. And I think you know, even though the other stuff we got this year wasn't, like, fantastic on that level, there are things from the Legends RPG that are very interesting. And the Zaysan stuff worked, and um, Patterns in Time is a big improvement over Team Avatar Tales. And so, you know, uh, an honorable mention and one slot on the list, I think, is pretty decent, ultimately. Um, so, with the list done, let's get into some final thoughts. So... Definitely, The Dawn of Yang Chen saved the year. Last year, we didn't have a novel, so it was great to have one again, and hopefully next year we also have a novel as well. It would be great to have Yang Chen too in 2023. Dark Horse, unfortunately, had a nightmare this year. Minimal new content, lots of delays, and lots of bad communication. Yes, there are likely reasons behind why this happened. And we'll get into that in the next slide. 
but just in terms of what books did we get from Dark Horse and it was half a free comic and Patterns in Time. That's not good enough. Two years into Avatar Studios, that's not good enough, unfortunately. And I don't think there's any need to mince too many words over that. It's just they can't do this again and it looks like next year they're not going to do it again. But again, things need to improve. The Legend RPG delivered some nice information, mainly on Roku's era in terms of new stuff. But it is mostly facts and details rather than full stories. So that's why it, what prevents it from having, I think, tons of spots on this list. But if you haven't read The Legends RPG, I would recommend doing it. It's just, again, it's, it's not going to be the same as like a full on novel and so on. So 2023 needs to be better and likely should be. But we need to see Avatar Studios deliver these next few years to get us to late 2025 and the first animated project. That's the point here. We're still in this, uh, un until basically 2025 and the animation comes out. And because of how early it is, like realistically, for tw but I think for most of 2023 and 2024, the publishing needs to support the franchise to get us to the animation. Because the, the marketing kind of a window, I suppose, for this um, animated movie is, I suppose, properly only going to start probably middle of 2024, if not late 2024. Who knows if delays will happen or not. But it does mean that there is still the core of like two years plus where publishing is going to have to make up all of the new content. And I think we've seen a bit of a struggle these last two-ish years to do anything that resembles like what we need to get to this stuff so the very last bit of this is just this what we need is a content roadmap what is the plan for the avatar franchise going forward sure it's great to know that there's a movie in 2025 and then the plan is for other movies and other projects but what about the next few years? Like I said, the issue is that we've just switched over to both ATLA and Korra doing one shots without anything from Dark Horse or Avatar Studios explaining this shift in approach. That's the problem that there's this fundamental communication behind the scenes of Avatar Studios exists and everything that they have said is that it's meant to be this new new era of sort of organization for avatar content both in terms of new animation but they are also still the ones behind the scenes making all of the stuff that comes out in publishing official and i think obviously we have to wait a few years for animation that's fine but i don't think we've properly seen avatar studios effect on publishing as much as we probably should and this is mainly communication about what we're doing in everything basically the comics is where it stands out the most of like okay we're only doing one shots we can't seemingly do super significant stories but what is the plan for what dark horse can do is there a plan for the years pre-movie is there a plan once animations start to come out like will dark horse be doing direct sort of like prequel tie-in content with the movie what's going on there right now it all feels very random that we are lucky to get new books and it just seems like borderline they flipped a coin to the side on what the new book would be and you know admittedly some of the stuff that seems to be happening next year the azula comic the mako comic is kind of what we want but they're not being as clear as they could be about it for sure um long gone are the days of the promise going straight into the search, going straight into the rift and not that many gaps or delays and just that sense of we can go from one notable big comic expanding the franchise, basically acting as book four. It doesn't feel like we're at that point anymore, but can we get back on track? Because for Dark Horse, we got a year with no Korra comic, last year followed by a year with no atla comic this year that's not good no atla comic this year feels particularly inexcusable since the katara top and suki trilogy seem to be the new approach for comics 
So why the entire year break off from this? Like, why wasn't the one shots? Why weren't the one shots continued this year? Why are we waiting until probably late summer next year to get the the fourth one shot comic? I don't understand that in the middle of all of this. Why that has taken so long? Next, Dark Horse are deserving of criticism, and um, as much as you can explain away certain things. Dark Horse still deserve criticism, but I don't think they deserve all of the criticism because I do feel a decent bit of it and maybe even quite a lot of it probably should actually be more aimed at Avatar Studios, who are in charge of the franchise overall because for Dark Horse, Avatar is this license that they are kind of like allowed to have and because fundamentally they always have to run everything through the license holder, Avatar Studios basically, Avatar Studios does effectively, I suppose, control to a certain extent what the comics can be about, uh, how many of them they put out, um, what they say about them, how they communicate about them. So yes, we could be frustrated about Dark Horse not saying anything, but the reality of it is that Avatar Studios is actually getting away with effectively not communicating about the books or anything like that. And this is where the Avatar social media channels, the official stuff, need to be 10 times better than they are currently. It should not be on fans to basically keep other fans informed about what the new stuff is. It's almost like, again, it's this lucky thing if the social media channels are on top of like book releases and merchandise releases. They don't really talk about it all that much. And this is where I thought the whole point of Avatar Studios was to, in a way, connect everything together, to have a little bit more franchise management but it feels like there is a fundamental disconnect between Avatar Studios and the official social media channels, um, which borderline seem more sort of run by fans, but because they're like official fans, it's this weird thing of like, there's some stuff they just don't seem to be able to post about. And then a lot of stuff that just doesn't seem particularly helpful. Um, and then a little bit on the novels as well. Even the novels are in a little bit of a weird spot. Chronicles of the Avatar is this official name for the series that we know about, but it's never once been explained, like, what this means, what the plan is for the novels overall. We literally just went from Kyoshi books and then suddenly the Yang Chen book got announced. We happen to know there is a book two, but they never said there was a book two when <laughs> book one got announced. You know, what is the plan? Like, nothing out there just full-on says that Chronicles of the Avatar means that this is an ongoing book series for at least the next however many years that will follow multiple avatars. They've never f said that. That's the implication. That is what it, by definition, seems to be because we went from Kyoshi to Yang Chen. But we don't know and we can't in a way guarantee that after Yang Chen book two, we will go straight into the next book because I think there needs to be continuity of releases with these books and it's like is it just fce who's just he's doing every chronicles of the avatar thing are we going to bring in new authors in to do other avatars how is this overall working what's the plan i want to get to that point where i think we just we know a little bit more about what we are to expect and that maybe they have some sort of a plan of like okay the movie that we are doing first is ATLA characters as young adults. So there's a few things that we need to put in place with the publishing side of things to get us there effectively and have the hardcore fans who want the books and stuff like that be informed. And so is there a plan to sort of use Azula in the Spirit Temple um, and future one-shot comics to do stuff like that? Are the Korra comics doing specific things with the characters to set up a future Korra movie? I'd like to just have some sense that that's what we're really thinking about and doing. Right now, it, it just randomness feels like the, the word of the day here with all of this stuff. But um, yeah, that's uh, basically everything I want to talk about in this video. The last thing to say at the end of the video here is a big thank you to my Avatar tier channel members for their support. Uh, Cash D's, Monty Monterosa, uh, Brit in Toyland, and insert first name here, insert last name here. Um, thank you for your support. 
Um, and again, the join button is uh, available if anyone else wants to join in and you will get your name included in this uh, list if you join at the avatar tier in other bigger videos that I do put out. But uh, yeah, other than that, let me know in the comments what your favorite story moments from 2022 were, what your thoughts are on my list. But that has been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.